Hello, and welcome to the MCA Services YouTube channel. In this presentation, we're going to be showing you some of the basics of chemisorption analysis and the information that we can obtain from it. We'll also show some of the theory that's involved. We show the difference between chemisorption and physisorption, and in other presentations, we go into physisorption in more detail. And we do have another presentation on chemisorption, which shows the various analytical techniques that we can use, so that may well be worth taking a look at. First of all, let's just consider why we might want to use chemisorption. Well, it's used for the characterization of catalysts. And as we know, catalysts are used in thousands and thousands of chemical processes, and they're absolutely critical. Just a few examples, and this is only a few examples, uh, noble metals for use as hydrogenation catalysts, platinum group metals used in exhaust catalysts, and noble metals, quite often mixed noble metals, used in battery and fuel cell electrocatalysis. Catalysts often take the form of an active metallic component, for example a noble metal or a precious group metal, doped onto an inactive support material, for example alumina, silica or zeolite. Now we can ac accurately dope the desired loading of an active material onto a support, and very often due to the high monetary costs or environmental concerns, we will want to minimise the loading, but without compromising catalytic performance. Ultimately, performance, or activity, of the catalyst will depend on the availability of the active materials to the reactant species. And in this slide we can see that some of the active sites are fully exposed, and they're shown as the full black circles. Other sites are partly exposed, they're shown by the hemispheres, and therefore they're only partly available for chemical reactions to take place. And other sites, as shown by the grey spheres, are completely obscured. They are completely unavailable for, for the, the catalytic reactions we want to undertake. So although we can dope to a desired loading onto the support material, and we can do that with, with very good accuracy, the process of doing so often causes a certain quantity of the active material to become completely inaccessible. And this might be due, for example, due to migration into the support material, uh, due to sintering to form larger particles, and so on. Chemisorption analysis provides really very valuable information on the availability of active catalyst constituents. This includes the area of the metallic species alone, the area of the entire sample, so that's the active material expressed per unit mass of the entire sample, including the mass of the support material, the dispersion of the active metal, and that's the proportion of the total loading that is actually accessible for chemical reactions. And it's really important to note that these characteristics are fundamentally important, not just during the development of a new catalyst, but also when studying their deterioration or depletion over time when they're used, and the effectiveness of regeneration. So now we look at the chemisorption process and how it differs from physics. Our presentations on gas adsorption show how gas sorption isotherms are used to determine information such as the surface area and the pore size distribution of a sample material. And these are fundamentally important to understanding a great many materials and their applications. As an example here, we have an alumina support, and on that we might have a precious metal such as platinum, as shown by the black spheres, and that's doped onto the surface. With physisorption, and here we show nitrogen as the green spheres, the adsorbate is adsorbed to the surface of the sample by physical forces, such as van der Waals forces. Essentially, these are relatively weak. The heat of adsorption is typically less than 80 kilojoules per mole. The nitrogen will be adsorbed to the complete surface. That's the active material and the alumina support. And what's more, through the reduction of pressure, the process is generally reversible. If we consider the same material, but this time chemisorption, and for example, we might consider hydrogen chemisorption, hydrogen being shown by the red spheres, Adsorption occurs through the formation of chemical bonds between the active constituent and the adsorbate. The essential difference is that the heat of adsorption is very much higher. Now, it could be as, as high as 800 kilojoules per mole. Furthermore, the sample surface is chemically changed through the interaction of the constituent's electrons and the formation of a new chemical species. What's more, this is generally irreversible just through reducing pressure alone. 
It's a little bit simplistic, but we'll come back to this process a little bit. But we can summarize the typical differences between physisorption and chemisorption. With physisorption, the heat of adsorption is low. Through application of a vacuum, the process is reversible. It occurs everywhere on the sample surface. It does not change the sample surface physically or chemically. It's often a multi-layer process under the correct conditions. And physisorption decreases as temperature is increased. With chemisorption, the heat of adsorption is high. It's generally irreversible just by through applying a vacuum. It only occurs on the active surface sites, not the support material. It changes the sample surface chemically, and it's always a single layer process. And what's more, as temperature is increased, so the chemisorption process increases. So we can now return to the actual chemisorption process, or rather the chemistry of it. Whenever we make calculations involving the area of the sample, such as metallic surface area or dispersion, it's critical that we know how many active surface atoms interact with each adsorptive atom or molecule. And this is called the stoichiometry factor. We're going to consider two of the most common adsorbates used for chemisorption. They're hydrogen and carbon monoxide. When carbon monoxide chemically adsorbs onto platinum, the carbon monoxide does not dissociate and each CO molecule adsorbs to just one platinum atom. The stoichiometry factor is therefore 1. However, for hydrogen, when this chemically adsorbs to platinum, the hydrogen does dissociate, and each H2, H2 molecule adsorbs to two platinum atoms. The stoichiometry factor is therefore 2. Now, there are some special cases where things get a little bit more complicated, and one good example is carbon monoxide chemisorption onto palladium. This can form a linear one-to-one -one bond with a stoichiometry factor of 1, and also a bridged bond with a stoichiometry factor of 2. And in this case, for hydro uh, CO adsorption to platinum, it's quite common to assume a stoichiometry factor of 1.5. Before looking at the information obtained from chemisorption, it's worth a quick look at some of the basic theory. Now, very often the Langmuir equation and its associated isotherm describes the process of chemisorption really quite well. This makes various assumptions. The first is that the sample surface has a fixed number of adsorption sites, and at any one time only one adsorbate molecule can occupy a given adsorption site. At each adsorption pressure, a fraction of adsorption sites are occupied, and this is called the coverage. All adsorption sites are considered to be energetically equivalent, and that means that the heat of adsorption is constant for all adsorption sites, and it's independent of fractional coverage, so it doesn't change as pressure is increased and therefore coverage increases. And finally, it's assumed that adsorbed molecules do not interact with one another. So the Langmuir isotherm is shown here. And we can see that at a certain pressure, all of the available sites, that's Ns, are adsorbed to N, in which case N over Ns is 1. At higher pressures, the isotherm is flat relative to the volume, uh, relative to the pressure axis, as no more adsorption, adsorption sites are unoccupied. And from this point, we can derive the monolayer volume. In terms of fractional coverage, the Langmuir equation from which this isotherm is derived can be written as this, theta equals n over ns, where theta is coverage. This is also equal to bp over 1 plus bp, where p is pressure and b is the coefficient of adsorption. And this account, the coefficient of adsorption, accounts for the heat of adsorption. Rearranging will give a plot of p over n. And providing that the adsorption conforms to the Langmuir model, this will give a linear plot with a slope equal to Ns. As mentioned earlier, knowing the dispersion of an active species on the surface of an inactive carrier is critical. Active metal loadings are usually really quite low, just a few percent by mass, or perhaps even lower, and the metals themselves are often rather expensive. 
So therefore we need to know how much actually remains accessible for chemical reactions after the catalyst manufacture and activation processes have been undertaken. It's also very important when we're assessing the efficiency of any regeneration processes. Dispersion is simply the number of sites which are accessible for chemical adsorption, NS, expressed as a percentage of total active sites, NT. The total active sites, NT, is determined by knowledge of the active metal loading and the specific active material itself. NS is determined here, where VM is the monolayer adsorption volume, A is Avogadro's number, FS is the stoichiometry factor that we presented a little bit earlier, and V mol is the molar volume of the adsorbate at standard temperature and pressure. Besides the active metal dispersion, there are a few other very important characteristics that chemisorption can provide us with. The first of these is the active metal area. Now, that's the surface area of the active metal constituent available for chemical reaction. And it's quite easily calculated from this equation here, where lowercase n a is the number of adsorbed atoms or molecules, fs again is the stoichiometry factor, uppercase n a is Avogadro's number, and sigma m is the molecular cross sectional area of the adsorbate. Now, this is reported or expressed per unit mass in square meters per gram of sample. And usefully, this can be reported as both the mass of just the active metal alone in the sample and also the total sample mass. So that's the active metal plus the support material. Finally, the active metal dispersion and area can be used to calculate the active metal particle or crystallite size. And we can assume certain geometries of this. Here we can see that S to V is the surface area to volume ratio of the desired particle geometry. And we could, for example, consider the, the S to V ratio of spherical particles or cubic particles. AM is the active metal surface area. Rho is the density of the active metal. And D is the active metal dispersion. So to finish off with, we can look at a sample report. This is an isotherm for carbon monoxide chemisorption onto a half weight percent platinum on alumina sample undertaken at 308 Kelvin. It's worth noting that we generated this isotherm using our Micromeritics 3-flex instrument, which has both static and dynamic chemisorption capabilities. This is static chemisorption, and we will cover all of this in, in the other uh, chemisorption presentation. So on the right-hand side, we can see we've generated the dispersion, the metallic area, both per gram of metal and per gram of total sample, and the crystallite size, both as a, a hemisphere and as cubic geometries. That just leaves me to say thank you for viewing this presentation. We have others on our YouTube channel, so feel free to subscribe. And don't forget there is another presentation on chemisorption that looks at the static and the dynamic analysis techniques.